Good day, ladies and gentlemen. What did Fulton Sheen have to say about the traditional Latin mass? Now, remember, Fulton Sheen died in the late 1970s. And for the vast majority of his life, he exclusively said the traditional Latin mass. I believe he was by ritual as well and had said an Eastern rite. Um, I would imagine he probably said the Novus Ordo a couple times uh, after it was promulgated. Nonetheless, he was a priest formed and trained in the traditional Latin mass. And the vast majority of his work comes before the 1970s. So what did he have to say about the traditional Latin mass? I should add that I know for a fact from people uh, close to the Fulton Sheen cause for his canonization that in his personal chapel, he was saying the traditional Latin mass essentially until the end. So he did have a great devotion to it. Well, there's a, a talk that I found from uh, well before the Second Vatican Council where he goes over the meaning of the Mass, and it's one of the best I've ever found about really explaining the depth of the traditional Mass. And when you compare that to the new Mass, you realize just how much has been lost. So enjoy this, and God bless. A great American patriot once said that he regretted he had only one life to give for his country. He meant that his love was greater than his sacrifice. That his life could be given only once in time and therefore could not be repeated. It is very different with the life of our Lord. Though the life was given once, it is eternally given. And it is eternally given and repeated in the sacrifice of the Mass. In this lesson, we are going to describe the Mass in terms of three of its principal parts. The offertory, the consecration, the communion. First, the offertory. This takes place when the priest offers bread and wine to God. Our blessed Lord, at that moment, if we may draw an image, is looking out from heaven saying, I cannot die again in the human nature that I took from Mary. That human nature is now glorified at the right hand of the Father the pledge and the promise of what your human nature is to be. But I can die in you, and you can die in me. Will you therefore offer yourselves to me? I can add nothing to the sacrifice of my love except by and through you. Now we begin to offer ourselves to him under the species of bread and wine. Let me tell you how this was done in the early church. If you would have come to Mass in the early church, you would have brought some bread and wine. You also might have brought some linen, fruits, wheat, oil, wool, and other things that were needed by the religious community that is, by the church. The priest would have taken all of these gifts, piled them up at the side of the communion rail, to distribute them to the poor after Mass. But the bread and wine which was brought, he would take some of that and use that for the offertory of the Mass. Now we no longer bring either bread and wine, nor do we bring these other things simply because today we live in a modern world where money is the medium of exchange. Instead of bringing bread and wine, we bring that which equivalently buys bread and wine. The important thing is that when we offer ourselves to God, we do so under the appearances of bread and wine. Why did our blessed Lord use bread and wine as the symbols of our offertory. I can immediately think of three reasons. First, in order to signify our unity with one another and in him in the mystical body of Christ. Just as a unity of grains of wheat make bread, and just as wine is made up from many grapes, so too we who are many are one in Christ. 
That is the first reason. Another reason is, perhaps no two substances in nature traditionally have so much nourished man as bread and wine. Bread is the marrow of the earth. Wine, its very blood. In bringing bread and wine, therefore, we are bringing those substances which have most nourished ourselves, given us life. Therefore, we are equivalently offering our lives or ourselves on the altar. A third reason, wheat and grapes have to suffer a great deal in order to become bread and wine. Wheat has to pass through a winter, and then it has to be subjected to a mill and to fire before the wheat can ever become bread. Grapes, in their turn, have to pass through the Gethsemane of a wine press before they can become wine. So to we who offer ourselves to Christ are destined to sacrifice. Therefore let us take those substances from nature which have given us life but which indicate in their very being the need of sacrificing and suffering in order to be united with Christ himself. We therefore at the moment of the offertory of the Mass are not passive spectators as we might be in the theater. We are going to be actors in a great drama. We are standing, as it were, on the pattern that the priest is offering. We are in that chalice. We are participants. We are co-offerers to Christ, through him to the Heavenly Father. If therefore we understand the offertory, we realize now that we have offered ourselves. That brings us to the question, what happens to us? The answer to that is given in the consecration. The priest, it will be recalled, is only the instrument of Christ himself at the altar. The Christ is the priest, Christ is the victim. When therefore the priest pronounces the words of consecration, he is only giving, loaning to our blessed Lord his voice and his hands. At the moment of consecration, the priest says over the bread, This is my body. And over the chalice of wine, this is my blood. At that moment, there takes place what is known as the mystery of transubstantiation. Trans means across. Substantiation refers to substance. This mystery means that the whole substance of the bread becomes the whole substance of the body of Christ. The whole substance of the wine becomes the whole substance of the blood of Christ. Notice we use the word substance. Now just as a subject has predicate, just as your personality wears clothes which are purely accidental to your personality because you can change clothes, so too bread and wine have what are known as accidents or appearances or predicates or species. Now after the moment of consecration, the bread looks the same as it did before. The wine looks the same. That is to say, the sensible appearances do not change, but the substance of the bread changes. The substance of the wine changes into the body and blood of Christ. How do we know they change? 
because our Lord said so. Is there any better reason in the world? Our blessed Lord said, This is my body. This is my blood. We believe. The next question is, Very well, we have offered ourselves with Christ. And the consecration is a repeating, a bringing up to date, a localizing, a representation of the death of Christ. How is the death of Christ represented in the consecration? Well, notice that the priest does not consecrate the bread and wine together. He does not say, this is the body and blood of Christ. First he consecrates the bread, then he separately consecrates the wine. First this is my body, then this is my blood. Now notice that that separate consecration is a kind of cleavage, a tearing asunder, a kind of a mystical sword that divides the blood from the body of Christ and that is how he died on Calvary. That is why the Mass is called the unbloody sacrifice of Calvary, while Calvary itself was a real separation of blood from body. Not that this is any less real, but that it is not as sensibly presented as it was on the cross. But this is not the whole story of the consecration. Remember we offered ourselves under bread and wine? See what has happened to the bread and wine? It's the body and blood of Christ. But Christ is not alone in the Mass. We are with him. What therefore happened to us? We died with Christ. The words of consecration, therefore, have a secondary meaning. The primary meaning is very clear, that we've given. This is the body and blood of Christ. Mystically divided by that separate consecration of the bread and wine, our Lord renews the sacrifice of Calvary. The vine sacrificed himself on the cross. The vine and branches, which we are, now sacrifice themselves in the Mass. So the secondary meaning of the words of consecration is about the branches united to the vine. So we say to our Lord, really, this is my body. This is my blood. All that I am. My body, my blood, my intellect, my will, all of my desires, intentions and motivations, all that I am substantially, are now thine. I die with thee, divinize them, transubstantiate them, change them, so that I am no longer mine but thine. Oh, the species of my life, the mere accidents, what I do in life, my peculiar duties, let them remain. They are only the appearances. But what I am in my essential relationships to thee, that make divine. I die with thee, O Christ, on Calvary. That is the consecration. Now we come to the communion. Remember that in the offertory, we were like lambs that were being led on to Jerusalem. And in the consecration, we are those lambs who were offered in sacrifice. Now in communion, we find that actually we did not lose anything at all. We did not die. We recovered life. 
We die to the lower part of ourselves in the consecration of the Mass, and we get back our souls ennobled and enriched. We begin to be free and exalted. We find that our death was no more permanent than the consecration than was the death of Christ on Calvary. In Holy Communion, we surrender our humanity, we get back his divinity. We give up time, he gives us his eternity. We give up our sin, we die to it, he gives us his grace. We surrender our self-will and receive the divine will. We give up petty loves, he gives us the very flame of love itself. That is communion. Now, because communion is so very important, we want to dwell on three particular aspects of Holy Communion. First, Holy Communion incorporates us to the life of Christ. Two, Holy Communion incorporates us to the death of Christ. Three, Holy Communion incorporates us to the members of the mystical body and their joys and sorrows. First, in Communion, we have unity with the life of Christ. That is to say, the whole Christ. The Christ born in Bethlehem, the Christ who lived in Galilee, who taught, who suffered, died, rose from the dead, is at the right hand of the Father, and is infusing his life into his mystical body. We receive that divine life in communion. Our blessed Lord said, He that eateth me, the same shall live by me. Actually, we do not so much receive him. As strictly speaking, he receives us we become incorporated to him. There's a kind of a transfusion, just in the physical order as there is transfusion of blood or life, so to here there's a tremendous transfusion of divine life into our souls in communion. And that is why at communion we always have such a deep sense of unworthiness. And the communion prayer is Domine non sum dignum. O oh Lord, I am not worthy. Is it not true that in human love, the beloved is always on the pedestal, the lover always on his knees? And so in divine love, we protest our unworthiness as we go to the communion rail to receive the divine life because we die to our lower life in the consecration. The divine lover invites us to his banquet. We poor, destitute creatures. He holds us in his embrace. Really, if our faith were strong, we would crawl on our hands and knees to the communion rail. And apropos of that life, our Lord said, He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives continually in me, and I live continually in him. Secondly, communion is not only incorporation to the life of Christ, it is also incorporation to the death of Christ. Here is something that we very seldom think of. We always think of communion as a relationship of life, but as a relationship of death. St. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, It is the Lord's death you are heralding whenever you eat of this bread and drink of this cup. Why is there a death involved? simply because we have not yet passed into glory. We have our old Adam with us. All of our sins, all of our concupiscences, our pride and covetousness and avarice, and we have to die to all of these. 
as the consecration itself suggested. When the farmer plows corn, he's very interested in life, but he's uprooting weeds, is he not? In other words, the condition of having the life of the corn is to bring death to the weeds, and the condition of having life of Christ is to bring death to the old Adam? Does not the gardener, when he nourishes the flower and cares for it, battle against insects? And in order to protect this divine life, we too have to bring some kind of penance and self-denial to that which is lower. Furthermore, if our Lord died for us, then we have to die to ourselves. And notice that after the resurrection, it was the relics of his passion and his death that he showed men. Mary Magdalene wanted to achieve that glory of the resurrection, and our Lord said, Do not touch me. But he said to Thomas, Touch my hands. Put thy finger into my hand. Put thy hand into my side. In other words, Thomas, you may commune with my death to see that I am the risen life. I believe that is the reason why the church ordains fasting before communion, in order to be sure that at least we will be incorporated in some tiny little way to the death of Christ before we receive his life. The third point concerning communion is that communion is not only incorporation to the life of Christ, incorporation to his death, but it is also communion with all of the other members of the mystical body of Christ. This is what we forget. That when we receive communion, we are being united with every other member of the church throughout the world. Your body, for example, is made up of millions and millions of cells. These cells are nourished by blood plasma or lymph. It courses through all the gates and alleys of your body to nourish and repair. It knocks at the door of each individual cell. It offers its treasure. Now what that blood plasma does to your human body is a faint, far-off echo of what our Lord does for his mystical body. The mystical body is made up of persons, not cells. Instead of human, human nourishment, there is the divine life of the Eucharist. And this Eucharist is the divine lymph, as it were, of all of the cells or persons of the mystical body of Christ. And as St. Paul says, the one bread makes us one body, though we be many in number, the same bread is shared by all. The lymph makes the body one, the Eucharist makes the church one. The communion rail is therefore the most democratic institution in the face of all history. We are communing therefore at the rail, not only with every member of the church, but with the joys of the church wherever they are in any part of the world, and also with the sorrows of the church, the trials and persecutions, for example, in mission lands. Therefore, every communion will make us more and more conscious of helping the society of the propagation of the faith in order that this body of Christ may grow, and in order that we may be more conscious of our communion, one with another in the body of Christ. That is the Mass. And thanks to it, we have the real presence. Our Lord is on the altar. Think of what our churches would be if we did not have that red tabernacle lamp telling us that our blessed Lord was there in his Eucharistic presence. We would just be meeting houses, Prayer halls, that's all. We would almost feel that we were standing alongside of the empty tomb of Easter morn and an angel were there saying, He is not here. But thanks to the real presence of our Lord in our churches, the Eucharist is the window between heaven and earth. Thanks to the real presence, we look out to heaven. And heaven looks down to us. That is why we can pray better there. We are praying before our Lord.
our Lord is just as really and truly present in the Blessed Sacrament as I am present before this microphone as I speak to you. Although the manner of presence is different, but it is the Christ, our Savior, our Redeemer, our love. God love you. It must be understood at the beginning that the Eucharist may be considered either from the point of view of a sacrament or from the point of view of a sacrifice. In order to understand this distinction, because it is rather a technical one, we go back to the analogy of nature. Every day of your life, you partake of certain food, the products of wheat, vegetables, fish, meat. They all enter into the sustenance of your life. They nourish you, they feed you. But have you ever thought of this other side? Before they can ever nourish you, they must be submitted to some kind of sacrifice. Before they can be the sacrament of your physical life, they must die or be sacrificed. The vegetables must be torn up from the roots, submitted to fire, the purification of waters. Animals must be submitted to the knife. Death, in other words, intervenes before you can live. Even nature, therefore, suggests that before you can have a sacrament, you must have a sacrifice. Before you can have communion, you must have the sacrifice or the consecration. Now, running through nature, too, is this other law that we live by what we slay. After all, we slay to some extent the vegetables and certainly the animals. And when we slay them and they submit themselves to our living, they are transformed into our higher life. This law seems to be applied even on Calvary. Is it not true when we look at that cross? that we live by what we slay? Who of us can claim innocence of the crucifixion? Which one of us can lay his hand upon the crucifix and say, I am innocent of the blood of this man? Our pride is there in crown of thorns, our avarice in the pinioned hands, our carnality in torn flesh. And yet, Though we are responsible for his death through our sins, he gives us his life. We live by what we have slain. We said that our blessed Lord came to this earth in order to redeem us. There's always been an anticipation in history of sacrifice, of this great sacrifice, Man, conscious of his own unworthiness, has taken wheat and grapes and bullocks and doves and sheep, made these things stand for himself. Then he destroyed them, in order that there might be some proof before God that he was not worthy to exist in his presence. You see, it was a vicarious sacrifice in the sense that they stood for man. Now, in the Jewish religion, the sacrificial types were ordained by God himself. One of them was the Paschal Lamb. But in all sacrifices, pagan and Jewish, the priest who offered was always distinct from the victim which was offered. If we call the priest the offerer, he is distinct from the fruit or the animal which was the offered. The two are never together, always distinct. 
You could point to the priest on one hand, the victim on the other. Until our Lord appeared. Our blessed Lord was both priest and victim. He differed from every other sacrifice in the world in the sense that he offered himself. He gave his own life. He was the offerer and the offered. He took our place. There was still a vicarious sacrifice. He took our place as if the sins were his own. Now, what is the Mass? It is the commemoration of that death and the application of that sacrifice of the cross to ourselves. Because this is rather a new idea, perhaps, to many, we will have to use an analogy. And the analogy is that of Memorial Day. All peoples have kept a memory of the soldiers who died in battle in order that their memory might evoke piety and love of country. In the United States, we decorate soldiers' graves on Memorial Day, recalling the sacrifice which they made in order that we might live and be preserved in freedom. Now our blessed Lord died as the great captain of our salvation. He did not come to live, he came to die. That was the purpose of his coming, to offer himself in our stead to undo, to undo our infinite guilt. His death, in a certain sense, was more important than the 33 years of his physical life, because it was his death that purchased our salvation. And the bloody sacrifice on the cross began when he instituted the Last Supper. Notice the words now of our Lord just before he instituted this memorial. He's going to have a memorial, not day, but act. And immediately before he institutes this memorial, Scripture states, Jesus already knew that the time had come for his passage from this world to the Father. He still loved those who were his own, whom he was leaving in this world, and he would give them the uttermost proof of his love. Now he proposes to give that uttermost proof. The Last Supper which is looking forward to his cross. He is not going to leave the memory of his death to the chance recollection of men because he knows that men have very short memories. He is going to himself institute the precise memorial. So on this night before he dies, at the Last Supper, he institutes not a memorial day, but a memorial act. Here we must recall the words of our Lord, the Last Supper. Quoting the Gospel of Luke. Then he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body. given for you. Continuing scripture. Then he took a cup and offered thanks and gave it to them saying, Drink all of you of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament, shed for many to the remission of sins. Thus scripture. At that moment, the substance of the bread became the substance of the body of Christ, 
the substance of the wine became the substance of his blood. Now he says to his church, and I'm quoting scripture, our Lord said, what I have just done, do you in your turn, in commemoration of me, Certainly these words mean that if the apostles were to do what he did, they had to be given the power to do it. Now this night of the Last Supper, when our Lord instituted this commemoration of his death, he was looking forward to Calvary on the next day. The cross would not be a distinct sacrifice. It would not be an entirely different oblation but merely a new presence of the same sacrifice. This Last Supper was the unbloody presentation of his sacrifice, and the next day would be bloody when our blessed Lord went to the cross. What we have to emphasize here is our Lord said, Do this. Repeat it. Prolong it. Extend it through space and time that all may share in my sacrifice. When we do this, we have the Mass. Here we invoke another analogy, and all analogies are incomplete. But here we use the analogy of a drama. Suppose that some great playwright wrote a magnificent drama, the greatest one that was ever composed. It might conceivably have been the story of how a whole community of people who are suffering from leprosy were cured of that disease, how they were restored to peace and unity among themselves, and how they all began to live in charity. Suppose, furthermore, that this drama was so well written and presented and acted that it would be a shame if only the people of one city and in one theater and at one moment of time saw it. What a tragedy, we would say, that a drama which did so much for the hearts of men should have no other recall no other memory than what, say, four dramatic critics wrote about it, telling about the characters, quoting a line here and there. Do you think our Lord went through this tragedy of Calvary only once and intended to leave no other memory than what four writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, might say about it? Of course not. Just as theater producers would organize road companies of that great drama, so our blessed Lord organized road companies, as it were. The great tragedian Christ offered his life for the sins of the world in accordance with the script that had been written by his heavenly Father. And immediately afterwards, in accordance with his instructions, the tragedy of Calvary is repeated throughout the world, thanks to the road companies, as it were, which are playing to packed houses every day, even to this very hour. This representation, this reenactment of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross applied to our day and to our lives is the Mass. In the Mass, the mystical body of Christ, actually united to Christ its head, offers through him and with him the sacrifice of Calvary. As our blessed Lord in the Last Supper looked forward to the cross, so in the Mass we look back to the cross in the Last Supper. Which brings up two questions. How does the sacrifice of the cross differ from the sacrifice of the Mass? And, 
Are the sacrifice of the cross and the sacrifice of the mass the same? Let us take similarities, then differences. First, what are the similarities between the cross and the mass? This is the basic similarity. There is the same priest in both, Christ, and the same victim in both, Christ. Both on the cross and in the mass, our Lord is both the offerer and the offered. That is why scripture says, quote, we can claim a great high priest, one who has passed right up through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us come boldly then before the throne of grace to meet with mercy and win that grace which will help us in our needs. Note the continuing exercise of his priesthood. In the Mass, he offers to his Father his sacrifice. He is pleading as High Priest on our behalf. Now here's an image that cannot be pressed too closely, but imagine our blessed Lord in heaven in his glory, holding out his scars, saying to his Heavenly Father, See what I suffered for men. As the Epistle to the Hebrews said, If the sacrifices of the Old Testament gave outward purification, shall not the blood of Christ who offered himself through the Holy Spirit purify our consciences to serve the living God? Our Lord is the priest and the victim. Between our sins and his glory, he interposes his eternal sacrifice. Will you ask, what is the role of the priest, the earthly priest? And he stands at the altar. But when I, for example, offer the Holy Mass, I am merely the instrument of Christ. He offers the Mass. He's the offered. I am not an instrument like a pencil, but an animated instrument. Every priest is the sacramental image of Christ in whose person and in who, with whose power he utters the words of consecration. We cannot repeat it too often. Christ is the priest, Christ is the victim. Now when we are ordained, we receive a power to act by the power of Christ and in his name. We lend our Lord our tongue. We give him the use of our hands. But the sacrifice is his. He is the priest, he is the victim. What now are the differences? Among others we will mention two. The sacrifice of the cross was a very bloody sacrifice, and the sacrifice of the mass is unbloody. That is to say, on Calvary, those who stood near it saw red rivers of redemption flow from hands and feet inside. But in the Mass, there is no physical crucifixion. The crucifixion is symbolically represented under the species of bread and wine. A second difference, and this is very important, on the cross our Lord was alone. In the Mass, the mystical body is with him. On the cross, our Lord was alone. He redeemed us all. By that sacrificial act, he put, as it were, a great deposit in a bank for the spiritually poor of the world. It will only be through the coming of the Spirit that we will be able to draw on that deposit. Now, when the Holy Spirit came and the Church began to offer the Mass, then, our Lord is not alone. We are with him. He, the head, makes use of his body. The mystical body is united with Christ, the head, the offerer. The mystical body is united with Christ, the head, as the offered. That is why when we offer the Mass, the prayers are in the plural. For example, 
We thy servants, Lord, and with us all thy holy people, offer to thy sovereign majesty this sacrifice. In the Mass, our Lord is no longer the sole priest, no longer the sole victim. First of all, he has associated with him us earthly priests who are the instruments of his power, but he also has victims associated with him too, namely the sacrifices and the battles against the old Adam and the crucifixion of our lusts and concupiscences, in fact, all of the trials of the mystical body of Christ. Mass, then, is not a souvenir. When you assist at Mass, it is not just the same as going, for example, to Calvary and chipping away a rock and saying, this is a souvenir of the place where our Lord died. No, the Mass is a vision. It is an action. In time and in eternity. In time because we see it. We see it taking place before our eyes on the altar. It is also in eternity as regards the value of redemption. All of the merits of our Lord's death, resurrection, ascension, glorification are applied to us. We unite ourselves with that great eternal act of love. The Mass then is not a distinct sacrifice from the cross. If when the Blessed Mother and St. John and Mary Magdalene If when they were at the foot of the cross, they had closed their eyes and merely consecrated on the tremendous mystery of love being enacted before their eyes, they would have been assisting at the Mass. And if we at the Mass close our eyes and concentrate on that mystery, we would equivalently be with Mary and Magdalene and John at the foot of the cross. The Mass is not a new sacrifice. It is the representation in space and in time of redemption. Why should we be penalized by the eternal because of the accident of time? Are there not women today who want to be Veronica's and to offer veils to the suffering Christ? Are there not men like Simon who want to help him carry the cross? And do we not want to take our own sufferings, to have them united with him in order that they might be considered part of our expiation for sins? It is said that today that science might someday be able to go back and pick up all of the sounds that were ever spoken and ever uttered, and ever made in the universe, because they exist someplace in space. That means that we might recover the voice of Alexander and Gregory, and Demosthenes, and even the voice of Christ. But what is that compared to going back, and finding, and repeating the very sacrifice of the cross? of taking the cross of Calvary, transplanting it into New York, to London, Tokyo, and Berlin, and applying the benefits of redemption to our souls now. What a mystery of love. This is the Mass.